from the urban communities where those incarcerated people should be counted and puts that into the rural communities where those prisons exist. And then, and some of those communities want prisons because of jobs, but they also want prisons because it gives them disproportionate power in the legislature. So, so that question to me is a really tricky, tricky one, um, and I, I avoid it like the plague. Um, um, it's, a, it's an interesting one. We, we spent a lot of time last summer um, just trying to get people to offer comment to the Census Bureau because we're, we were hoping the Census Bureau would say they were going to count incarcerated people in their home communities. Last, the beginning of last summer, they said they were going to continue their plan of counting people where they're incarcerated. They had a comment period last summer where we were trying to get people to offer comment. Um, we have not heard what their plan is, and the Census Bureau appears to be in disarray. So any hope that um, that will be addressed is, is quickly diminishing. So Fair District's PA will be working on talking to, looking for an administrative solution with the criminal um, Department of Corrections here in Pennsylvania. That will be a, a next attempt. Once we're waiting to hear what the Census Bureau says, then we'll be approaching the Department of Corrections to see if they will address that. And if not, that's going to be another another agenda for us because it's just wrong. It has to be fixed. Them in, in, in that way. 
Yeah, my question is along the same lines uh, for Red Fatale. Uh, so I watched that Marcella show as well, uh, and I thought at some point you discussed disclosure and how uh, right now we have some disclosure laws that aren't really followed as far as gifts go. And then there was a big uh, discrepancy between what's given on one side and what's disclosed on another. Is that purely campaign finance or? Well, well it's right, on the lobbying reports that the thresholds are too high right now it's, um, it's for gifts, uh, you, you, you don't have to disclose it if it's under $250 per, in the aggregate per source. And with the gifts lodging, I'm, I'm sorry, with lodging, transportation, hospitality, it's six, $650 uh, in the aggregate per single source. So although we know a lot of of, of money is being given in all four of those categories, hospitality, lodging, gifts, you know, tra transportation, it all flies under the radar. And the lobbyists sort of play the game as, okay, well, like, we're kind of maxing out on reads, so now why don't you, you know, you have to pick up the tab for this one, you have to pick up the tab for this one. So games are played, so you have, no one's, no one's, no one's name shows up because what you really need, I mean, and, and the remedy for that is uh, one remedy is first penny disclosure, which is sort of a fallback from the gift ban. The gift ban says no gifts, no gifts uh, from lobbyists to legislators. First penny disclosure says, okay, you can give what you want, but every single penny, even the first cup of coffee, has to be disclosed. So I think the point here that we made in, in the PowerPoint was thresholds are too high, all the gifts are flying under. To, uh, to put a little butt on that, would, would you agree that this is one important tool in the toolbox that we're able to institute this gift ban, that it will help us sort of, uh, you know, work on those disclosure laws as well, maybe, maybe next, or maybe make them even irrelevant? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely, very important. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Representative Vitale as well. I know that you recently about, I think it was 1071, the plastic bag bill? Yeah, 1071. So I don't understand the legislative process. And if you could help me understand why a bill that had so few co-sponsors and seemingly so little support in the legislature when it came up for a vote, came up for a vote out of committee when a bill like um, HB 722, which starts out of the gate with 87 co-sponsors and it's adding more, I think we're up to 90 of them today. Why is that stuck in committee? I just don't understand how okay, it works. Okay, um, two points. Just, just, I mean, just by way of background, what this bill uh, would do would be prevent municipalities like the city of Reading, city of Philadelphia, from imposing a tax fee surcharge or ban on plastic bags. Um, many municipalities, 165 municipalities in the state of and the country already do it. Los Angeles and New York City and Washington, you know, for, for good reasons, for better reasons, to, you know, to preserve landfills, you know, to protect the rivers and oceans. It's, it's a bad piece of environmental legislation. This is what's driving it. There is one manufacturer, Novalex is a company, one of the world's leading plastic bag manufacturers. They have the Helix Poly plant in Milesburg, which is in Micana, a Democrat who's the House Democratic Whips district. Yeah. They reached out to him and said that you can get this bill passed, we can get a couple more jobs in your district. He, he's driving the bill. It's also uh, the senatorial district is Corbin, which is who's, who's in, 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 in Senate Republic leadership, so that's a problem too. So what's driving this Bill, which is bad public policy, is one company who has the ear of, of someone in, in leadership. Um, one thing I think people just who lobby have to understand is you have bills who have, you know, one prime sponsor, no co sponsors, and can be passed in a week. You know, like the budget bill might just have the appropriations chair, just goes. And you could also have you could also have bills that might have you know 105 co-sponsors, more than a majority, 
which don't go. It's, 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 there's not that, it's good to have co-sponsors, um, but it's really, you know, really sort of, you know, getting leadership to move the bills, the inside game is, is, is kind of, is kind of key. So, so, co-sponsors are good, but it's not going to dictate whether the bill moves or not. If that answers your question. Sure. I, I'm just amazed that one company has the ear and power of the legislature, whereas something that has huge public support is not going to yeah, because we beat that bill. We beat that bill uh, at the end of last year because we were able to put on a good lobbying effort. But they they tweaked it. They took out, and I don't get into the weeds, but they took out the supermarkets. So we lost that, that focus, that, that lobbying group to do it. You know, they, we, we actually, when the, when the vote went on the board for the first time, they did not have their 102 votes at about 94, 95. And you can see the members playing playing the board, you know, and, and, and you can see they didn't call, the, they didn't stop the vote, they just kept the board open, and, and then you can see the working members going down and work, and then you see a, a red flip, the, you know, red flip the green, but until they finally had the 102, then they, then they closed, then they closed the board. That's sort of the power of being in the majority, and um, why, why uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm very frustrated. Very frustrated, but, the, but it moves on to the governor and the Senate now, and we're just we're going to keep lobbying on. Um, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I, I encourage people to still have questions, send us questions, and then afterward, the panelists are going to hang around for a little bit. Um, I, I'd like to close with, uh, with another parable, with another story. There was once a, an admiral, a very famous, very rich, very powerful admiral who had the biggest ship in all of the seas. And it was dark and stormy out. And the admiral saw the light signaling to his ship. And the light said, make a right turn to avoid disaster. And the admiral said, signal back. I am the greatest admiral on the seas. I am the greatest admiral there ever was. How dare you tell me to turn right? You turn right. And the light signaled back. No, you turn right. And the Admiral said, I will sink you right away if you do not turn right. You must turn right. I am the Admiral. You get out of my way. I am the master of the universe. I am in charge of all. And the light signaled back and said, I'm a lighthouse. You turn right. And right now in our society, we have a few very uh, egotistical Admirals who think that they can avoid the rocks that are in front of them and are not listening to the lighthouse of history, and are not listening to the lighthouse of, of our times, and to the lighthouse of, of the people's will. And it's our job to tap the Admiral on the shoulder and say, you know, you're gonna crash into the rocks and we're all on the same ship and we're all about to go down together. So you gotta make a turn. And that work is exhausting, it's long, it's hard, it's tiring, it's joyful, it's meaningful, it's holy work. And it was written about 1,800 years ago that it is not upon you to finish the task, but neither are you free to desist from it. And we're all part of a very long story of moving toward democracy. And it's not upon any one of us to finish the task, but it is upon us to keep going toward it. And if I've learned anything from marching, it's you put one foot in front of the other until you get there. And you're never really gonna get there, you just keep walking. So, it's 9 o'clock at night, and it is not upon us to solve democracy tonight. So, let's go to sleep and try again tomorrow. If anybody would like to stay after our next question, please.